Welcome to Wingman. Uh, for those Do I use this too? Hey, good morning. You know, I was uh, speaking in Granbury last night. Can you all hear me okay? Is this working? There we go. All right, I was speaking late last night in Granbury, so I apologize if I'm a little slow this morning. What I'm going to be sharing with you is a briefing. And it's going to be a brief of a briefing because it's about a six-hour briefing that I've given at the Naval War College, the Naval Postgraduate School, and the Defense Department, and so forth. And it really is bad news. And you really don't want to get up and come before a group of Christian men and give a, a word of bad news. But there is good news. And, and, and you all know the good news if you know Jesus. But I'm, I'm going to share with you and walk through the slide presentation. And then I'll show you, show you the parts where there's good news. And then there's a call to action at the end. Basically, I'm an investment manager, and in 2008, I was hired by the Pentagon to look at economic warfare. And I'm going to tell you what I found. Basically, I believe we're in the midst of an economic war right now. We're fighting it. And if you can believe that, you're going to have to accept three assumptions. Number one, do you believe that there are enemies of the United States of America? Number two, do you believe that they don't want to go head to head against our military? And number three, do you believe we have vulnerabilities in our system? If you accept those three things, then the rest of what I'm sharing with you is going to make sense. In 2008, the Defense Department commissioned me to do a study to look at what was happening in the financial markets and, and question, is this an act of economic warfare? I presented my first white paper in December of 2008. I commissioned, was commissioned to do the study in 2009. And in June of 2009, I presented the formal study that um, initially, the initial response was, this is amazing, this is a new area for us, the Pentagon, we've got to get into this, economic warfare is, is the future of warfare. But within uh, a day, I was called back and I was told by the Pentagon, we've decided we're going to classify this study and if you ever talk about it again, we're going to put you in jail. And I fortunately had friends, and from one of my friends uh, knew Jim Woolsey, who was the head of the Central Intelligence Agency under the Clinton, uh, term and what he did was he sent copies of my study to John McCain, Joe Lieberman, and John Kyle and said if something happens to Mr. Freeman read this from the Senate floor and then I got a call back the next day and said uh, we want to apologize to you I think you misunderstood us we weren't <laughs> we, we weren't going to classify this but it, it's been a it's been a long journey and it's been a it's been a God journey God has taken me through this it's been ups and downs I've probably given this briefing a hundred and sometimes this year and over 200 times in the past couple of years. I've been to Washington, I don't know how many times, at least two dozen times. I've met with congressmen, senators, DIA, CIA, FBI, and, and really, this is something our nation's not prepared for. We don't really have a handle on this. But let me share it with you. In 1999, the Chinese government brought two senior colonels of the People's Liberation Army and said, we have one job, how do we beat America? We want to make the 21st century the China century. And it looked impossible. What they looked at was how we had beaten Saddam Hussein and kicked him out of Iraq in a matter of day, or out of Kuwait in a matter of days in the first Gulf War. It was a shock. The Chinese military was not prepared for American strength. They were expecting the military from Vietnam and the commitment of the American people from Vietnam. And they were shocked to see how powerful we really were. 
and they declared we were the only, the one and only true superpower in the world. They looked at our economy, they looked at the internet, they looked at all of the development and the massive boom that we were having, and they said no one can match the American economy. They couldn't match our economy, they couldn't match our military, how do we beat America? And they came up with a doctrine, it's called Unrestricted Warfare, and they published a book titled, with the same title, Unrestricted Warfare in 1999. Now, what they were facing was, do you, can you remember all the way back to 1999? All, all that far back? Did you know in the year 2000, the Office of Management and Budget predicted that the entire federal debt would be paid off by the year 2010? Now, that seems a long time ago, doesn't it? All our federal debt completely paid off by 2010. They looked at that. And what they found was, if we're going to beat America, we're going to have to hit her in her wallet. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, our heart follows our treasure, which is an interesting concept. Most people who preach on this preach that uh, where your heart is, there your treasure will be. And that's not true. It's where you put your money. It's where your heart goes. It's an important commitment. I heard Pastor, I go to Gateway Church, and I heard Pastor Robert Morris preach on this. And it's just a powerful thought is we can make an action of placing our heart somewhere by putting our treasure there because our heart will follow it. In America, our treasure has been in money. And so our heart has been in money. And so the way to hit us is to hit us in the wallet. In 2004, a group associated with Al Qaeda decided that they wanted to change the elections in Spain. And you know what they did? They bombed the trains and they scared people. They panicked people. And as a result, the pro-Al Qaeda candidate was elected in Spain. In America, you wouldn't do that. You bomb our trains and we get mad and we want to go and fight and win. But you hit us in the wallet. You make our economy hurt or collapse and people worry about their pension plan and their 401k. That's when people panic. That is our heart. That's our, our area of hurt. And that's what the Chinese found and that's what they wrote about in their book, Unrestricted Warfare. So what they wrote is financial warfare, not military warfare. Financial warfare will be the most important kind of warfare in the 21st century. And it's not based on a military strategist or a statesman or a politician. It's based on a guy named George Soros. Now, how many people in here have heard of George Soros? How many people had heard of George Soros in 1999? A couple. The Chinese knew who he was. They called him a financial terrorist. And they mentioned him in their book 19 times. They mentioned Osama bin Laden 21 times. How do you beat America? They said, well, if we could ever get the techniques of George Soros applied with the, with the passion and hatred of America like Osama bin Laden and combine those two, we'd have a hyper-strategic weapon capable of defeating the United States. We've got aircraft carriers. They're thinking in different terms. They mentioned Soros and bin Laden together nine times in their book. Here's their methodology. To beat America, you muster a large amount of capital, launch a sneak attack against financial markets, bury computer virus and hacker detachments, and ultimately cause an enemy nation to fall into social panic, street riots, and the political crisis. That was the methodology to defeat America, written in 1999. And they said a single man-made stock market crash is one of the best weapons we've got. Also, um, manipulating their currency or invading with computer viruses. In 2008, we saw evidences of our vulnerability. We saw evidences of commodity ma manipulation, naked short selling, credit default swaps, and we saw the failure of Lehman Brothers. All of those things point to the vulnerability of this nation. It happened four years ago, four years and a month ago. We were in the midst of the worst financial crisis we've had since the Great Depression. And so here is a YouTube of what actually happened in September 2008. Further panic out there. And that's what actually happened. 
If they had not done that, then their estimation was that by 2 o'clock that afternoon, five and a half trillion dollars would have been drawn out of the money market system of the United States, would have collapsed the entire economy of the United States, and within 24 hours the world economy would have collapsed. Now we talked at that time about what would happen if that happened. It would have been the end of our economic system and our political system as we know it. And that's why when they made the point, we've got to act and do things quickly, we did. Do you remember that? You remember that weekend? It was right after September 11th, 2008, on the seventh anniversary of September 11th, 2001, the entire financial system almost collapsed because Lehman Brothers failed. And they were worried that ATMs would stop working. I remember September 11th, 2001, I was in Grapevine watching that happen. Not, I watched it on, on television in the morning and then we came here and everybody was quiet and silent because planes weren't flying and everything was weird. Do you remember that, 2001? I also remember 2008, the level of panic that was around the world. You know, every weekend it, you'd go to, uh, on Friday evening you'd, you'd, you'd um, go to bed late and then Monday morning you'd find another bank had failed. And they met all weekend, bankers met all weekend and they, you know, AIG and Lehman Brothers and all of that. All of that that happened in 2008 sounded an awful lot like what was written in this book, Unrestricted Warfare. So how did we get from the greatest economy in the world and that the Chinese didn't think could ever be beaten to the collapse of our system nearly happening in 2008? Well, according to George Soros, the man that the Chinese said were the expert on financial warfare, what happened was we had a failure of AIG, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers being destroyed by what's called bear raids, shorting of stocks and the buying of credit default swaps. Those mutually amplified one another. Rolling Stone did a study and they called it Wall Street's Naked Swindle. I don't know how many people here are familiar with the idea of naked short selling. Most people don't even know what short selling is. Do we have people familiar with short selling? Short selling is a way that you can profit from the decline in the value of a stock. So Apple computer was $705 a month or so ago. And somebody look, you could look at that and say, that's overpriced. And you can say, I'm going to bet it's going down. And how you do that is you'd go find somebody that owns shares of Apple Computer. You'd borrow a share. Let me borrow one of your shares. You'd sell it on the open market for $705. Then when it came down, and it was $600 last, uh, at the close yesterday, $605, something like that, you'd buy that share back, and you'd return the loan. You'd return who you borrowed it from. You'd profit $100 a share. It's a way to profit from the decline the value of stock. It's legal, it's legitimate, it's good for the markets, it happens all the time. What I'm, not, what I'm talking about here and what was written about in Unrestricted Warfare is different. I'm talking about naked short selling, which is doing the same thing except you never borrow the share. You just sell. Can you imagine that? Would you like to say any company you think is overpriced, you just go in and, and, and Facebook, when it comes out, you just sell. Tell your broker, sell me a thousand shares of Facebook. He says, okay, where are the shares? I don't have them. You don't deliver them. That's naked short selling. And Rolling Stone wrote about how naked short selling is a way that you can depress the value of a share company. Did you know when Lehman Brothers failed that half of the decline in the share price came from people who were selling that never even owned or couldn't even borrow shares? That's naked short selling. Half of the decline in the value. In fact, there were about 100 million shares of Lehman Brothers on September 11th through September 15th that were sold and never delivered. All according to the doctrine written up in Unrestricted Warfare. On September, September 11th alone, there were 23 million fails almost, and the next day, 33 million fails. As a result, do you remember this? The SEC canceled all short selling in 2008, in September. Barry Ritholtz, who's an expert on hedge funds, writes in New York, he said, the bear raids on the banks and the brokers were not a case of piling on by US-based hedge funds. This shorting was coming from London and Dubai, and the huge increase in shorting occurred on the anniversary of 9-11. The same institutions attacked on 9-11 were the ones suffering in recent days. Is anyone investigating whether this is a case of financial terrorism? Well, actually, I was. And I wrote a report for the D Defense Department that was mentioned in The Economist. And what you see here, and I don't know, does this have a laser pointer here? 
what you see, this spike up there is an attack on Lehman Brothers. It's no different than the attack on 9-11-2001, except it's a financial attack. And what we found is that radical Islamic groups operating out of the Middle East using an exemption called uh, the Arbun transaction, working with Barclays Bank and Sharia Capital, were short selling Lehman Brothers. And they did it starting with the Sovereign Wealth Fund hitting this company. And when they did that, Lehman Brothers began to fail. That's one secret weapon. I wrote all these in my book, and I'm going to skip through here so, for sake of time. But are you familiar with credit default swaps? A few people? Credit default swaps are insurance. Insurance that someone will repay their loan. They're also a secret weapon. Did you know that you can buy insurance in a form of a credit default swap on people you don't even know? And if they don't pay their debts, then you get paid back uh, proceeds. It's like buying fire insurance on your neighbor's house. Did you know in New Orleans at one point for a very brief period of time you could buy life insurance on total strangers? You know what they found? They found murder rates went up. Can you imagine that? Credit default swaps, and I won't go into the details. I mention them all in my book. Bottom line is these were things that were happening in 2008 when our market was going down. These were vulnerabilities and they were written by the Chinese as weapons of ways to bring down an economy. So on the week of 9-11-2008, Lehman Brothers collapsed. Naked short selling increased 1,600-fold and credit default swap rates skyrocketed. Barclays was slated to buy Lehman Brothers. Do you remember Bank of America bought Merrill Lynch? That weekend, Barclays was supposed to buy Lehman Brothers. They walked away. They said no. Why did they say no? Well, they said, because the shareholders wouldn't support. The shareholders primarily were Abu Dhabi and Qatar, two sovereign wealth funds in the Middle East. They ended up buying the Lehman assets out of bankruptcy and they made a $4 billion profit out of it in three months. And then Abu Dhabi and Qatar pulled out $5 billion from Barclays in mid-2009. When Lehman Brothers failed, the whole system collapsed. Okay, the Chinese, in February 2011, endorsed the idea of using new concept weapons, attacking using financial means. What's the most powerful weapon China has? Well, their control of our American debt. The Soviet Union endorsed the same strategy, and this is the highest ranking Soviet defector, is Yan Senya, who defected in 1982, wrote this book, We Will Bury You, and he talked about the Russian plan to use external economic weapons against the United States. This is a professor named Panarin. He's a Russian studies professor. He's a former KGB officer, and he's Vladimir Putin's favorite professor. And this professor said that in 1998, he predicted that the United States would collapse in the year 2010. Why? Because of our American debt. He called our debt a pyramid scheme and predicted that China and Russia would usurp Washington's role as a global financial regulator. He predicted that they could work together and create a new currency to replace the United States dollar. Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson said that during 2008, during the Summer Olympics, the Russians approached the Chinese and said, let's dump our American debt, force them into a bailout, and if we force America into a bailout, it'll cause a deep economic crisis for Washington. It was a disruptive scheme. You know what? The Chinese who had written about how to do this said no. And they said, let's not dump our American debt. But the point is the Russians were willing and in fact they dumped $60 billion worth of Fannie and Freddie debt in the summer of 2008. Osama bin Laden talked about attacking America using by attacking America's economy. Do you know why they picked the World Trade Centers to attack? Picked it as an economic target. If you want to kill the mass number of people, pick any NCAA game or any NFL game and fly a plane into that stadium and you'll kill 100,000 people easily. You hit the World Trade Centers because you want to hit the American economy. And that's exactly what he said in his speech. He said, if we hit the American economy, they won't be able to afford the military. And if they can't afford the military, they'll stop bothering us in the Middle East. That was basically bin Laden's theory. And you know what? They spent about $100,000 on that attack and it's cost our economy over a trillion dollars. Why? Why do they hate capitalism? Well, 
according to Sheikh Yusuf al Qaradawi, the collapse of capitalism is necessary to prove that the Islamic way is better. And Sheikh De Lorenzo also says the same thing. They call it financial jihad. Now, I'm not talking about the average individual Muslim who wants to practice his free uh, exercise of religion rights. I'm talking about the radicals, the Osama bin Laden types, many of whom are heading up some of the largest Sharia compliant arenas in the world. I don't know if you know this, but well, the Iranians have talked about this. Hugo Chavez has talked about this. Here's the one I'm looking for. Did you know Muammar Gaddafi was the eighth richest man in the history of the world? He's the only one in the top 10 in the, that is in the top 10 that has lived this century. Did you know that he was worth some $200 billion, most of it in the United States and Europe? He controlled accounts that we're finding now. They're on Goldman Sachs accounts and accounts in Stan, uh, at Stanford Financial Group in Houston. It accounts around the world. This is what's going on. This is Chinese military doctrine that is being used to attack our nation. And we've had new risks that have emerged since 2008. For example, in May 6, 2010, the stock market dropped 1,000 points in six minutes. Do you remember that? It's called the flash crash. Do you know what caused it? No one really seems to know what caused it. Maybe there's some connection to the fact that this gentleman here, Sergei Alinikov, was arrested, sentenced, sent to prison for stealing Goldman Sachs high-frequency trading codes. Then he was released from prison, and now they're bringing new charges against him. The risk is, is that somebody could break into our high-frequency trading codes, our trading algorithms, steal the algorithms, alter them, and cause a market crash. This is the methodology our enemies are using to destroy our nation. So George Soros, here's a new risk that's emerged. George Soros, in 2010, decided that he wanted to have an ideas dinner to focus on a new area of risk, which was Greece. Greek credit default swaps in February 2010 were 420. By March of 2012, they were 25,960. You know what's happening in Greece? Their economy is collapsing. One of the reasons it's collapsing is they have too much debt. Another reason it's collapsing is they have too uh, big of a social safety net. Another reason it's collapsing is they're paying too much in interest on their government debt. What they've determined is, the Germans said, this was an external economic attack, the same kind as I'm talking about in unrestricted warfare. When bin Laden was killed, SEAL Team 6 found on his person a document that was titled, A Strategy Concept for Destroying the Economy of Europe. A strategy concept for destroying the economy. This is a new form of warfare. I don't know if you were aware of this. Most of the people in the Pentagon weren't aware of it until I began these briefings. So the German government figured it out. They caught on and they banned naked short selling and naked credit default swaps. The day they banned them, the euro was about a buck twenty, a dollar twenty per euro in May 2010. Right now it's a dollar thirty per euro. The euro's actually gotten stronger while the European economy's gotten weaker. Why? Partly because they banned these secret weapons. So we've got new other risks. And I was talking at the table earlier, Brent, did you, this guy is Vladimir Putin. He wants to end the shale gas plays in the United States. Did you know that? Because it's hurting natural gas prices around the world, and he owns Gazprom. And Gazprom needs high natural gas prices to keep the Russian economy going. In fact, he's been accused of crashing a plane in Poland because the Poles were going to start exploiting the shale gas underneath their country. Here's a snail darter. This is the sand lizard. This is the delta smelt. Environmental groups have caused all of these to change the economic development in this country. This one in particular in West Texas, the sand dune lizard in West Texas is, is right now being considered possibly endangered. If it's declared endangered, that little lizard will cost the American economy about a million barrels a day of oil we're producing now and potentially three million barrels of oil that we could be producing in three or four years. If oil is $100 a barrel and we're, we could produce three million barrels a day, that's $300 million a day in the American economy, but that little lizard might cancel all of it. Why would they cancel it? Well, 
I can tell you the Russians have been pouring money into environmental groups to try and get it declared endangered. And this is Oleg Kalugin, who was one time head of counterintelligence to the Russian KGB. He's admitted, he came out and said, oh, sure we fund environmental groups. And they're not alone. There's groups in the Middle East that were trying to fund Matt Damon, his new movie called Promised Land, which is an anti-fracking movie. All of this is economic warfare. All of it was written in 1999 by the Chinese in the book Unrestricted Warfare. Texas has the 14th largest standalone economy in the world. Part of that economy depends on oil and natural gas development. I believe we're under attack. Europe is under attack. And so we did a, a war game in the Pentagon. It's called the Unrestricted Warfare Symposium, named after this book. And what they found is if we go into a full-fledged economic war and the Russians and Chinese team up, they can crash our dollar, drop it 75% in value overnight. Why? Well, for one reason, we spend $400 million an hour at the federal level. $150 million an hour of that's borrowed money. Our debt has climbed astronomically as a percentage of GDP. This is, few, this is where we are now, and this is where we're headed. In fact, according to the President's best budget estimates, we'll have $25 trillion in debt by the year 2021. So what that means is we're in the midst of a war, which is what I started off telling you. And then this is from Steve Forbes and Jim Rickards. Unlike a traditional war, our enemies aren't targeting a city they're setting their crosshairs on you, your bank account, your life savings, and our national currency. The dollar has come under fire. Our enemy's weapons will not be soldiers, tanks, or missiles. They will covertly attack us using an arsenal of economic weapons of mass destruction. So I did a study that was put out by the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence recently in his group. It was done by a group called USGI. And, and it was for the, for the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence. And the recommendation is we've got to recognize that economic war is as real as any kinetic threat. It's become clear that the defense intelligence communities don't intersect or understand what the financial communities understand. And that is this, what was, this is the Chinese language edition of unrestricted warfare. How do you beat a superior enemy? Amass a great deal of capital. Do you think China has done that? Do you think the Middle East has done that? launch a sneak attack against its financial markets. That happened in 2008, and I put the evidence in my book on, in Secret Weapon. Then cause hacker detachments and financial crisis and computer viruses. Do you think that's going on now? The ultimate goal is to cause our nation to fall into social panic, street riots, and a political crisis. Now, that's the problem, but it's not the real problem. The real problem is not how much debt we owe. That's a result of the real problem. The real problem we can see in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy 28 lists a bunch of blessings and a bunch of curses for a nation. A blessed nation is one that lends to many nations and borrows from none. The opposite of that is one that borrows from everybody. We are the opposite of that. Well, if the opposite of being under a blessing is being under a curse. We're a nation under a curse. The only solution to a spiritual problem is a spiritual solution, and that's turning to God. And I want to call out to you, I believe every person in here has a great and growing relationship with Jesus. I've met a few of you, and I've watched as you worship the Lord, and it's a powerful thing, and it's a beautiful thing. But we have a responsibility for our nation According to 2 Chronicles 7.14, the Lord God spoke to Solomon and said, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. We are his people. We have to humble ourselves and say, God, America hasn't got it figured out. This nation isn't everything. I can't solve this problem with my vote. I can't solve this problem with my checkbook. I can't even solve this problem by getting in a fighter jet and flying f to fight for America. I can only solve this by humbling myself and realizing that you're God in heaven. I need to humble myself. I need to pray. I need to seek your face. I need to turn from my wicked ways. 
and ask you to heal my land. Now there's a promise in Jeremiah chapter 18. It's a beautiful promise. It says, basically, I'll put it in kindergarten English, no matter how good you've been as a nation, if you turn away from me, I'm going to punish you. And no matter how bad you've been as a nation, if you return to me or you come to me, I'll forgive you. We have the story of Nineveh and Jonah, and we can see the wicked, wicked Nineveh turned to God and he forgave them. America needs to turn to God, and we've got to do it all in love. And that's my call. And that's what I say in the Pentagon. That's what I say to three-star generals. That's what I say to the former head of the CIA. That's what I say wherever I go, America needs to return to God. We have a serious problem. It's a financial problem, and we're vulnerable to a serious financial attack. But the solution is not financial. The solution is spiritual. And I thank God for wingmen and what you do to support other men. And I thank God for, for the fact that you're sharing the love of Jesus wherever you go. And I thank God for this country, for the good people here. And I say to you, uh, God bless you and God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Thanks for your support of Wingman Ministries. We would love to hear your comments about today's show and help you get connected with other men in your local area. To keep up to date on upcoming events, element groups, and speakers, please visit our website at wingman.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for our email list. 